All right. Um, hello, everybody. And welcome to the first part of our webinar series on web application uh, accessibility. Um, my name is Rolf Smeds. I'm the product owner of the Vardin Design System. And um, I guess I could tell you that there are three reasons why we're having this webinar uh, today. Uh, first of all, there's a lot happening in uh, the accessibility or digital accessibility uh, space, especially in Europe at the moment. Uh, secondly, uh, the Vining Design System has recently gone through uh, a significant amount of uh, accessibility improvements. And uh, perhaps uh, the reason why we are having this uh, webinar specifically today is that today is uh, the Global Accessibility Awareness Day. Um, the webinar today is going to be about accessibility standards and accessibility legislation. Uh, there's going to be a second part uh, in a few weeks on uh, June 7th, I think, um, where uh, I'm going to go a bit deeper into how to actually build accessible web applications with Vaadin. Um, we have kind of a tight schedule today since there's a lot of material to cover. Uh, so although I usually like to take questions during my presentation, uh, I think this time, uh, since I'm probably going to go over time, over our time slot uh, anyway, it's probably best that we wait with the questions until the end, but you can already write your questions either into the chat or there's a separate questions uh, uh, chat or a questions uh, uh, panel where you should be able to post uh, specific questions about, about things. And uh, I'll do my best to answer those at, uh, at the end of the event when I'm done with my presentation. So um, ping me if, if uh, on the chat if the audio suddenly cuts out or anything weird like that happens. But other than that, uh, otherwise, I'll just uh, go ahead with the presentation. So <clears throat> um, the reason uh, why uh, we felt that it was good to have this webinar on standards and legislation is that um, when you start looking into accessibility for the web, uh, you tend to run into a lot of different acronyms and a lot of different numbers, and uh, it can all be quite confusing and, and intimidating to try to figure out what is what and how all these things relate to each other. So we're going to start with, with that part today. So uh, standards and legislation. Uh, and I, maybe I should um, also mention that I'm not a lawyer, uh, but I've done my best to uh, try to um, understand all the relevant standards and legislation in the US and the EU as well as possible. So <clears throat> I guess what I'm saying is that I, I can't be certain that I have all the details correctly. So if you know, if you have uh, if you know something I don't know, please let me know in the chat yeah, or in the questions. So um, today's agenda will be as follows. We'll start by looking at uh, what is digital accessibility, uh, just going over the basics of, of what, we, what we're talking about here today. Uh, we're going to have a look at screen readers, and then we're going to go into the various accessibility standards that you should know about. Then we're going to go into legislation, again, with the focus on US and EU. And I'm going to wrap this off with uh, shooting down some common misconceptions and what you should do right now. And although, uh, like I said, we're probably going to go a little bit over the 45 minute time slot, uh, I'm sure we'll have time for questions at the end. So what is digital accessibility? Well, 
In short, uh, digital accessibility is about ensuring that everybody can access and use your website and your web application and so on, or your mobile apps for that matter, regardless of whatever disabilities or impairments they may have. So let's have a look at what those disabilities or impairments could be. First of all, uh, we have dexterity or fine motor control issues. Uh, there are thousands of causes that you might have for, for having these issues, such as, for example, you might have an injury or some kind of defect uh, in your hands, or you, you might have some kind of neurological issue uh, like Parkinson's or cerebral palsy, or it could be situational. Uh, for example, you might be holding a baby with one hand and only, hand, only have one hand available for, for interacting with whatever you're trying to interact with. Um, so the things you might need to, or the things that you should keep in mind uh, to make sure that people with fine motor control skills are, are able to use your, your UI is, first of all, uh, tap or click targets. So uh, I'm sure everybody has used uh, a touchscreen UI where the tap targets are so small that it's difficult to actually hit them with your fingertips. And obviously, if you have some kind of fine motor control issues, uh, then that's going to be even more difficult. And likewise, um, uh, with a pointing device like a mouse, uh, you, you could also run into issues where the element that you're supposed to click is so small that it's difficult to hit with the mouse. And obviously, if you have issues with fine motor control, then those problems are going to be much, much bigger. So ensuring sufficiently large uh, tap targets or click targets is, is one of the important things to keep in mind. Another issue that can easily come up is if uh, there are operations in the UI that can only be done with drag and drop. So drag and drop is, is a great uh, way to provide like direct interaction with whatever it is uh, your, 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 the user is supposed to do. But it can be quite difficult for people who have, who have trouble using a pointing device or a touch screen. So it's always good to provide uh, an alternate way of performing the same operation instead of just relying on drag and drop. Uh, similarly, um, uh, touch screens tend to rely on a lot of uh, gestures like swiping and, and so on of various kinds. And those can be quite difficult for people with fine motor control issues. Uh, I have personal experience of uh, a close relative who uh, has trouble unlocking his phone and answering phone calls because of the swipe gesture that you're supposed to do that with on, on that particular model. So uh, that can easily be an issue. <clears throat> and of course, uh, depending on the severity of, of those problems, um, you might be unable to use any pointing device at all, in which case, of course, uh, you're stuck with a keyboard or a corresponding uh, input device. And that from the UI, that of course requires that the UI is actually uh, fully usable with a keyboard instead of a mouse. Then we get into color blindness, uh, which is uh, probably one of the most common impairments that affect accessibility uh, because uh, amongst men, one in 12 has some form of color vision deficiency. So in all likelihood, we have several people uh, watching this webinar right now who have some form of color blindness. For women, it's about one in 200, so not nearly as prevalent, but even so. Um, and the way color blindness can be an issue in UIs is uh, when UIs use colors to convey information. Now, there's nothing wrong with that it's in itself. Uh, color is a very effective way uh, to convey information uh, because the brain is very good at, uh, at, at uh, detecting colors and associating colors with, with data or with, with concepts. So, um, but the, the problem is, of course, if you're unable to uh, correctly identify and distinguish those colors. So, for example, these uh, traffic light colors plus the purple that we have here as an example, um, for a person with a certain type of color blindness, those can look like this instead. So 
The blue one is still very distinct from the other colors, but especially uh, the red and the green colors, or well, the second and fourth from the top respectively, those are so close to each other that it's really difficult to discern them, especially if they're not right next to each other. So what you need to do in terms of UI design is to make sure that uh, you'll also convey the same information in some other way. For example, with icons or shapes, or even better, with text, because that is obviously less ambiguous and uh, you're not forcing your users to uh, interpret some abstract iconography. Next up, we have low vision. So not blindness per se, but uh, vision impairments that can, for example, affect, uh, can cause blurry vision or low contrast vision. So um, the important thing to keep in mind for those users is to ensure that you have sufficiently large font sizes, either as a default or as a configurable option in the UI, or uh, by making sure that the UI uh, scales and behaves correctly when the user uh, uses the browsers built in uh, font scaling or, or UI scaling uh, functionality. This is actually very similar to ensuring that a UI uh, it has responsive layouts and scales down correctly to smaller viewport sizes, such as on a mobile phone. So accessibility and responsive layouts on mobile uh, friendliness is actually very closely related in this regard. Also, of course, ensuring that there's sufficient contrast between text and the background and also between non-text elements such as buttons, input fields, and basically any UI element that needs to be uh, discernible from uh, the surrounding uh, elements. And again, this is something that can be either a default or you can have a high contrast mode built into your UI or, or uh, rely on, for example, uh, well, Windows has this high contrast mode, which uh, you might be able to rely on, but it depends on uh, who, whether your users are guaranteed to use Windows since not everybody, of course, does that. And then finally, we have blindness. Um, it's, of course, the least prevalent of these impairments, uh, but we're still talking about 39 million people worldwide. So that's still a significant amount of, of potential users. Now, a lot of people might think that blind people hardly use computers at all or don't use web browsers and web mobile apps and so on, but there exist uh, thankfully, uh, several different assistive technologies that help blind people navigate uh, graphical UIs. For example, uh, screen readers that read the UI uh, as generated audio voice to the user, and also braille displays that we see here in the image uh, on the slide, which uh, converts the UI uh, or, or uh, the on-screen content into Braille, that uh, raised dot uh, notation. And of course, uh, a, a user that is unable to uh, actually see the UI uh, won't be able to use a pointing device or a touch screen. So they are also uh, forced to use a keyboard for all their interactions in the UI. So again, keyboard usability is very important here. So let's have a closer look at screen readers because those are actually one of the more complex uh, topics when it comes to web accessibility. Screen readers are um, uh, operating system features or separate uh, utility applications that convert uh, use, uh, that use text to speech to convert uh, the visible UI into speech. And um, the user navigates the UI typically with a keyboard. Uh, and in addition to the normal, uh, regular, um, uh, like uh, tab-based uh, jumping between focusable elements in on the web page, screen readers uh, provide the user with something known as a virtual cursor, which gives them kind of a more advanced keyboard navigation uh, that allows them to traverse um, page elements that are not normally focusable. So, for for example, uh, if we have a table. Uh, on the web page, the virtual cursor helps the user traverse the columns and rows of that table, which wouldn't normally be keyboard accessible that way. 
They also provide shortcuts to different parts of the page. Uh, for example, the navigation, the header, the footer, and so on, which hopefully the screen reader has managed to correctly identify. So let's next have a look at what uh, screen readers is, is actually like in usage. I'm going to show you a uh, part of a uh, YouTube clip uh, by Steve Sochin, uh, who is a solution architect at DayQ Systems, which is one of the uh, perhaps more well-known accessibility consultancies out there. And he demonstrates how to use a screen reader to navigate the web. Uh, and actually, the, this example here is about um, uh, booking a flight through a, well, flight booking website. Let's hope the audio works correctly here. Field. Flying to edit required as auto complete city or airport. Land. Uh, let's let's fly home. I, I'm from Minneapolis, so I'm gonna type in. Send suggestion. Minneapolis, Minneapolis, MN, MSP, Minneapolis, MN. Clear field. Flying to field. Valid. Departing expanded. Enter a date or choose one from the table below. Showing May 2018, June 2018. Edit. MM slash DD slash AI. Blank. Now it says MMDD AI uh, because it's the screen reader doesn't know how to pronounce all four Y's together. But that's something that as a screen reader user, you just sort of learn to deal with. So I have a choice here and it gave me instructions about entering the date numerically or I can tab into the calendar and choose a date uh, from the calendar here that exists. So I'm just going to type in. 11. What is tomorrow? 18. 2018. 2018. Close the date. And. Expanded. Oh, I did round trip, which was silly. So let's say I'm going to come back. One. On the 21st. 2018. Close the date. List with advanced options button. Add a hotel, add a hotel, add a, hotel, add a car, add a car. Search button. And we're going to search. DTW. All right. Well, all right. Um, well, thank all right. you, everyone. I think that's. That already gave you a pretty good idea of, of what it's like to use a screen reader. And as you can probably tell, it's, uh, it's, it's quite a different experience from uh, using a, a, a web browser uh, or a web page in, in, a, in the traditional fashion, so to speak. So um, there are a number of, uh, actually quite a large number of screen reader software out there. Uh, but some of the most common ones are NVDA, which is a free application for Windows. There's also JAWS, uh, which is a commercial uh, alternative for Windows. For Mac OS, there is actually a built-in uh, feature in the OS called VoiceOver. And there are also screen readers for mobile devices. So there's a version of VoiceOver built into iOS. And uh, for Android, there's uh, an app called TalkBack. And one of the interesting things about these mobile screen readers is that while you can use them with, with a, for example, a Bluetooth keyboard, uh, uh, some users use them instead with uh, kind of a touch uh, gesture uh, interface on the mobile's touch screen instead. So instead of pointing and swiping at specific elements on the screen, which of course they can't see, uh, the entire screen area of uh, the device acts as kind of a gesture uh, tablet kind of thing. So, like I said, there are a lot of screen reader software out there. These are just the, th uh, the, the three most common ones, but luckily uh, they make up about 90% of uh, the screen reader uh, usage or the market share for screen readers. So uh, when you're uh, thinking about which screen re readers to test in, uh, these three are, are pretty good candidates for, for that. So let's next look at accessibility standards. First off, we have WCAG, or the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines. Uh, so as the name suggests, uh, this is a standard comprising a number of guidelines and a success criteria for making web content accessible. The latest version is 2.1, uh, that added about 70 new criteria to 2.0. Uh, there's also a 2.2 version coming up at some point, and even a 3.0 version in the works, but uh, at the moment, you don't necessarily need to worry about those. Um, WCAG has three priority levels. 
uh, at the bottom we have level A, which is the bare minimum to uh, ensure any level of accessibility. On top of that, we have level AA, which is generally considered a strongly recommended level of accessibility to, to provide. And additionally, there's a triple A level, which adds some additional criteria and recommendations for that might be important for certain groups of users. But if, uh, the thing you need, you need to be familiar with here is level AA, because the vast majority of uh, all the accessibility legislation in the world currently is based on week 2.0 or 2.1 level AA, so that double A middle level. And as I'm trying to convey with this diagram here, each uh, additional level, of course, also contains uh, all the criteria from uh, the lower levels. So uh, about those criteria, uh, WCAG 2.1 contains 77 criteria in total. Out of those, uh, level AA, which includes level A, uh, contains 50 criteria. And uh, according to my own assessment, for the vast majority of web applications, about 44 of those are relevant. Uh, the remaining six criteria are mainly about um, audio and video content. So if your app deals or website deals with audio or video content, uh, those are probably relevant for you as well. But for the vast majority of web applications, especially those made with Baden, uh, we're looking at about 44 relevant criteria. So let's have a look at what those criteria are like. Uh, the first example here is criteria 141, use of color. And this is exactly what I talked about in the colorblindness slide uh, in that um, you should not use color as the only means to convey information about something. The next example is contrast. Uh, this is contrast for text content. And there are different contrast requirements for regular size body text, and large text. And for example, text inside logos is exempt for, from this criterion. Uh, the contrast for regular text should be 4.5 to 1. And there are a lot of utilities out there uh, including often built into web browsers themselves that help you figure out what that means in practice. Uh, there's a separate criterion for non-text contrast, so for elements such as buttons uh, and input fields and so on. Um, criterion 412 is an interesting one because it's very important for screen reader uh, support. So name, role, and value refer to uh, the, the fact that in order for a screen reader, which is a piece of software, uh, in order for that to be able to correctly identify various on-screen elements, uh, they need to be, they, th those elements need to convey their role and their name and their value correctly. So for example, if you have a button, the screen reader needs to be able to identify it as a button. And if that button, well, the, that button should have some kind of a label or uh, some, some way of conveying what it does. And that information also needs to be conveyed. And that's what the name refers to. And for input elements, of course, the value is equally important. Now, for these success criteria, uh, when you go into the uh, WCAG uh, website, you'll find uh, for each criteria, a set of techniques of failures. So those, of, those techniques are examples of how you might go about uh, conforming with that criterion. So here we have three uh, techniques and, and the third of which uh, of, of those is split into a number of, of sub techniques. And um, this doesn't mean that you need to do every single one of those things. Uh, usually, it's sufficient to do one or two of them or so. But these are examples of how you, should, how you could go about uh, complying with this criterion. If you click on one of those techniques, you'll find uh, a page with a more detailed technical explanation of how to actually implement it. There's also a list of failures for these criteria. And uh, well, they list ways in which uh, it lists ways in which you might fail to comply with with this criterion. So uh, it doesn't mean that these are this is not necessarily an ex 
exhaustive list, you might fail in different ways as well. And failing in one of these ways doesn't necessarily mean that you fail the criterion as a whole, but it does give a good indication of that. For those who have been looking at especially European accessibility standards, you might have come across a thing called EN301549, also known as the Digital Accessibility European Standard. And as the name implies, it's a standard of accessibility requirements for ICT products and services within the EU. Now, the great thing about this uh, is that you don't really need to care about 301, 549 separately, because for all practical purposes, it is the same as WCAG 2.1 level AA. So uh, it does add a few extra criteria about voice communication and audio video content. So again, if your application or website deals with voice communication or audio video content, those might be relevant for you as well. But for the vast majority of applications, you can pretty much equate uh, 301.549 with uh, WCAG 2.0, uh, 2.1 level AA. The next big standard is YARIA or just ARIA, which stands for Accessible Rich Internet Ac Applications. It actually consists of two different parts. First of all, we have something called ARIA attributes, which are HTML features for supporting screen readers and other assistive technologies. Uh, they provide uh, ways to, um, to provide um, semantic information on what various uh, elements on a web page are. That uh, role name value thing that uh, we looked at as part of uh, WCAG. So for, as an example, uh, if you have a button with an icon, but no visible label, maybe you don't want to have a visible label there because you don't have the space for it. So for a user who can see the icon and hopefully interpret it correctly, this works just fine. But for a user relying on a screen reader, uh, this can be problematic if it's not correctly implemented. Uh, because that icon is not something that, I mean, images in general are not something that screen readers can uh, interpret and convey to the user as speech. So you need to convey what this button does in some other way. And one very common ARIA attribute is the ARIA label attribute. So if you have a button and you supply it with an ARIA label attribute uh, whose value conveys the function of the button, that will make that button accessible. ARIA also has uh, something called the ARIA authoring practices, which is which basically uh, show you how to build common UI patterns in an accessible way. So it has implementation recommendations and examples of implementations. And this is very similar to WCAG superficially, but the ARIA authoring practices are more specific and technical compared to WCAG. WCAG are like the guidelines of what you should be doing, whereas the authoring practices uh, show examples of how you could do that. So to summarize these standards, we have WCAG, which are the guidelines and criteria. We have the authoring practices, which are more concrete recommendations and examples of how to fulfill those criteria. And we have the ARIA attributes that uh, help you support screen readers. So or to put it in another way, WCAG is the what, the auth ARIA authoring practices are the how, and the ARIA attributes are the helpers. Now, uh, these are standards, not laws. So on their own, these, don't, these standards don't really require anybody to follow them. That's, of course, where legislation comes into, in, into the picture. So um, let's start with the United States, where the main uh, piece of legislation that is relevant here is called Section 508. The scope of 508 are websites and applications of, the, of public sector bodies and also private companies that receive public funding. Uh, it's both about, uh, the scope is, it both covers um, uh, the UIs that citizens use to uh, access information and services by those uh, public sector bodies, 
but also internal non-public facing sites and applications that are used by the employees of those public sectors and the private companies that are within the scope of, of the law. Um, since 2017, Section 508 has been effectively aligned with WCAG 2.0 level AA. So there's that same WCAG standard again. And since we're talking about the United States here, uh, the main way in which uh, Section 508 is enforced and the main reason for it uh, being in the headlines quite often is lawsuits. And there has actually been a significant increase in lawsuits about web accessibility uh, in recent years. In 2017, there were 814 lawsuits. And in 2020, there were 2,523 lawsuits. So that's a pretty good reason to make sure that your accessibility is in order in the United States. Next up, we have the European Union. Um, and uh, the directive most closely corresponding to Section 508 is Directive 2016-2102, also known as the EU Web Accessibility Directive. Uh, just like 508, it covers public sector websites, internets, and mobile apps. And it also includes internal uh, sites and apps used by employees of the public sector. So, for example, uh, it covers national and regional administrations, public health care providers, public schools and universities, police and courts, and so on. And, um, of course, it's based on uh, our good old friend EN301549, which, as you probably know by now, corresponds to WCAG 2.1 level AA. It's been in effect since uh, 2018. Now, um, the thing that makes the EU directives a bit special in that they're not laws uh, in themselves. Uh, instead, EU directives um, require EU member states to enact national laws that implement the directive. So some examples of national laws that implement uh, Directive 2102 are, for example, in Finland, uh, a law called 306-2019. And in Spain, Royal Decree 1112, 2018. And in Germany, there's on a federal level, uh, something called BITB 2.0. Now, Germany being a federal country um, is a bit complicated in that the various states in Germany can, uh, and many do, uh, enact their own regional accessibility legislation in addition to BITB 2.0. And those uh, state uh, specific laws can be more stringent than uh, this EU directive. But I'm not, I'm not sure if any of them actually are. Um, and in general, these national laws can be more strict than the directive, but the directive uh, places a, a minimum level uh, that they need to comply with. There's an excellent website called directive2102.eu that provides a good summary of this directive so that you don't have to read the actual law. I did that and uh, it wasn't exactly uh, light uh, bed, bedtime uh, reading. So here's uh, a summary of how uh, Directive 2102 works. So we have the national legislations that are implementations of 2102 and 2102 uh, points to 301549 as its technical standard, and that is, for all practical purposes, equivalent with WCAG 2.1 level AA. Now, that was the public sector. Uh, what is currently happening in the EU is uh, a directive concerning the private sector as well. That's Directive 2019-882, also known as the European Accessibility Act, or EAA. So it covers, um, and it actually covers more than what I'm going to talk about here today, because it doesn't only cover websites and web applications. But since this is a webinar specifically about web applications, I'm, I'm going to uh, limit the scope of what I of what we cover here to that. So in that context, uh, EAA covers 
uh, private sector services in e-commerce, banking services for consumers, and air, rail, road, and waterborne transportation. There's an exemption for companies with less than 10 employees and less than 2 million euros in turnover. Um, the, the funny thing about EAA is that as far as I can tell, there isn't currently any uh, technical standard or, or, or uh, specification of, of uh, exactly what uh, these private sectors need to comply with. Um, so that's apparently still uh, being worked on at the moment, but it's expected to be based on EN301549. So for all practical purposes, we get 2.0 level AA. Um, the deadlines for this directive is that EU member states must implement uh, corresponding national laws by June 28, 2022. So basically in uh, about five weeks from now. That doesn't mean that the laws are automatically in effect, of course, but the directive as, uh, enforces a deadline for the, for, well, uh, or states a deadline for the enforcement of those national laws for uh, June 28, 2025. So this means that in practice, uh, if, your, if your websites or apps are within the scope of the Euro European Accessibility Act, you have uh, three years and about five weeks of time to uh, conform to this legislation. And of course, member states in various EU countries may impose earlier deadlines, but I'm not aware of any that would have done that. So to summarize uh, accessibility legislation, in the US, we have Section 508 for the public sector and publicly funded companies. And that's WCAG 2.0 level AA. In the EU, we have the corresponding Directive 2102, and um, which is for WCAG 2.1, but the difference is really minor. And then on, for the private side, for e-commerce, transportation, and banking, we have the European Accessibility Act, will, which uh, will come into effect at the latest in three years from now. So um, that's that. Now I want to wrap this up with shooting down some common misconceptions. We're going to be talking uh, about these misconceptions and, and actually the right ways of providing accessibility in more detail in part two. But since I'm pretty sure that some of you are not going to be attending part two, I still want to share these, uh, these um, corrections with you because these are important takeaways. So first of all, first misconception is that accessibility is a feature that you can add to an existing non-accessible UI, a bit like you would add salt and pepper to food. Well, let's continue the food analogy for a bit. Uh, so with pizza. I mean, we all probably love pizza, but we also know that it's not really healthy food. And we can try to convince ourselves that if we add something green and healthy to the pizza, that it will somehow magically become healthy. But of course, that's not really the case. And accessibility is a bit like that. So for example, there is this, um, there is this type of, of utility called accessibility overlays. Uh, it's a type of product that promises to turn a non-accessible website into an accessible one by some kind of JavaScript magic. And while that certainly can work to some extent, um, there has been a lot of issues with these accessibility overlays or accessibility, accessibility widgets, if you will. Accessibility is, is one of the most popular ones of that type. And uh, what I can tell you uh, is that between January and June of 2020, they, so in just six months, there were 96 lawsuits in the US against companies that used accessibility overlays to make their websites accessible. So there are a lot of issues with these overlays. And in some cases, probably many cases, they do more harm than they actually help. There's a website called overlayfactsheet.com that gives you more in details on that. 
But I just told you a moment ago about these ARIA attributes that you can add to your, to your uh, UI code, and those should just make any HTML accessible, right? Well, unfortunately, it's not quite that simple. First of all, the golden rule of ARIA is don't use ARIA. The reason for that is that semantic HTML is always better than uh, sprinkling a bunch of ARIA attributes on otherwise non-accessible HTML. We're going to, in part two, we're going to have a closer look at what we mean by semantic HTML and how to make sure that you're using it correctly. Uh, as, and as we learned the hard way ourselves at Vaadin, conflicting semantics can actually confuse browsers and screen readers and make accessibility worse than it would have been. So uh, again, we're going to have a closer look at that as well, but um, it, the, the, the point with conflicting semantics is that uh, you can sprinkle uh, ARIA attributes on your HTML elements that are uh, conf in conflict with the uh, native semantics of those HTML elements. OK, next misconception is that accessible components guarantee an accessible application. And of course, as the product owner of uh, uh, an accessible component library, I would love to be able to say yes. But unfortunately, that's also not quite the case. To give an example, if we have a button here with just an icon with no uh, accessible name, it can be based on body button, which is an accessible web component. But if you don't actually provide uh, a programmatically identifiable name for that button, it's still not going to be accessible. And there's no way for, for example, the body button component to force the developer to provide an accessible name. So if you do provide the ARIA label attribute to it, then it is accessible. So it, using accessible components still requires you to use them in an accessible way in order for the UI to be accessible. And of course, uh, few application UIs are comprised entirely of components. In most cases, you also have a bunch of uh, your own UI constructs and your own CSS styling and so on that you're applying in addition to those components. So those, of course, also need to be accessible in order for the UI to be so. But the good news is that the, um, the opposite is, of course, true. If you use inaccessible components, you pretty much guarantee that your UI will be inaccessible because just like you can't make a healthy dish out of unhealthy ingredients. You can't really make something accessible out of unaccessible parts. Next misconception is about testing, which we're also going to be looking at more in part two. Um, there's this idea out there that automated testing will give you a perfect uh, uh, score of, of understanding of, of how accessible your UI is. There are tons of accessibility testing tools out there. Many of them are built right into popular web browsers. And uh, they're good. They're really good to have. But they cannot give you a, a complete picture of the accessibility of a web page or web application UI. And I'll give you a pretty clear example of why that is. Let's say we have a button here with a label. So far, so good. Uh, if we implement that with the HTML button element, that's perfectly accessible because the button element itself has the correct semantic identity of a button. So a screen reader will be able to identify it as a button. Great. But you could also implement it as a div and apply some CSS with a class name to make it look like a button and then plug some JavaScript into it to listen for click events to make something happen when you click on it. So for most users, that div will, for all practical purposes, be a button. But for a screen reader, there, there's no way for it to know that this is a button. The class name is not sufficient for it to figure it out. Uh, the styling is of no use for a screen reader. There's it need, there needs to be some way of, for the screen reader to programmatically identify this as a button. And if that, that isn't there, it won't be accessible. 
And the thing with programmatically identifying various HTML elements is, of course, also what automated accessibility testing tools do. They, an accessible, uh, accessibility tester utility cannot know that this div is a button any more than the screen reader can know this. So although this div is absolutely not an accessible button, uh, an accessibility testing tool is very likely to ignore it because it just looks like a piece of text to it. So the next misconception is that an application can be 100% accessible. And this is a bit tricky because it depends very much or entirely on what we mean by 100% accessible. So it could mean that our UI can get, gets a perfect score on one automated test. But what if it gets a different score on a different test? So does 100% accessible require that it gets a perfect score on all automated tests? Well, this is already problematic because you probably can't even find all the various tests, uh, testing tools out there. But okay, so what if we actually test uh, the website or web application manually with screen readers? What if we find that it has really good support for the big three screen readers, NVDA, JAWS, and VoiceOver? Well, there are other screen readers out there, so we need, do we need to test with those as well? And do those also need to be great? And what is like, is good support good enough? Could it be better? Does it need to be superb? Do we need to have superb user experience on all screen readers and every single user is perfectly satisfied and unicorns and rainbows? The point is that there's no clear objective definition on 100% accessible. Accessibility, just like, like the healthiness of food or usability or scalability, cannot really be uh, determined numerically like that. So, but surely a score be below 100% on some testing, testing tool at least means that you need to make it better. Well, even that is a bit iffy because let's take an example. Uh, this is the W3C website, basically the organization responsible for HTML and for WCAG and for ARIA and so on. And uh, on the right here, you see uh, the result of an accessibility test run on that website on, in, in uh, the Lighthouse test built into Chrome. And it gets a 93% score. So it's 7% short of a perfect score. Does this mean that the W3C website is not accessible? Definitely not. Uh, does it mean that they really should try to make it 7% better? That's a bit questionable because these scores don't really tell you about how severe the remaining issues are. You can have a 99% score, but that final 1% can be uh, something that completely blocks uh, a large part of users from interacting with your site. Or you could have a 50% score, but uh, all the screen reader users are, are perfectly happy with it. So it's not, again, uh, as simple as that. So what can you do then? If 100% uh, isn't the goal and you can't trust uh, automated tools and, 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 and it's already complicated, well, there's a couple of things you can do. First of all, you should upgrade to Vodin 23. Um, we, um, we started looking uh, more seriously into the accessibility of the Vodin platform uh, about a year and a half ago. And we realized that we didn't really have a good understanding of, of how accessible, for example, our components were. So we enlisted the help of a company called Tetralogical, uh, another uh, accessibility consultancy. This one is based in the UK. And they did an accessibility review of all VARIN components. And um, we got a uh, approximately 76% score on that assessment. This was based on uh, VARIN 19 at the time. And so we have since spent about a year improving the accessibility of the VARIN design system. And we did a second assessment uh, a few months ago, 
on what was at the time uh, an alpha version of Vadin 23.0. And we got an 84 uh, percent score at that time. So that means that roughly half of the issues that were identified uh, had now been fixed. And of course, we are continuously uh, continuing to improve the accessibility of our components. That's an ongoing project that we're, we're, uh, we're working on. Uh, but the point is that the accessibility in Vardin 23 is significantly better than in Vardin 19. And even though uh, those do that, that difference doesn't sound as big numerically, many of those issues that were identified in Vardin 19 were very severe. And those, uh, the vast majority of those severe accessibility issues have now been fixed in Vardin 23. And the other thing you can do is uh, attend part two of this webinar, which uh, will be on Tuesday, 7th of June at the same time. So uh, 17 uh, p.m., well, 5 p.m., 17 o'clock Eastern European summer time. I'll post a link uh, to, the, um, to that webinar in the chat. You can find it there. And um, that's it. We're about six minutes over schedule, so we have actually pretty plenty of time for questions. And um, if you have any questions that you uh, don't want to ask here or, or uh, don't only come to think of uh, after this webinar ends, uh, you can reach me by email through that email address or on Twitter, or you can also write uh, in our uh, Discord chat, uh, you'll find a URL at the bottom of this slide here. There's a, a, a channel in that Discord chat dedicated to accessibility called A11Y. And um, yeah, I, I monitor that channel and other people interested in accessibility also monitor that channel and can help you with your questions there. But yeah, um, let's see if we have any questions here. Okay, we have one question from uh, Gualtiero Testa. Uh, what about Varin 8 and 14 accessibility scores? Well, we don't have scores for Varin 8 and 14 because we never conducted a proper... Uh, oh, let's do it like this. Uh, we never conducted a proper uh, accessibility review, uh, as far as I know, on Varin 8 and Varin 14. So, uh, in all, all honesty, the, we don't really have an answer to that. Uh, what we do know is that uh, in, the accessibility in VARIN 19 was virtually identical uh, with, the ident uh, with the accessibility in VARIN 14. So uh, those severe accessibility issues that were identified in VARIN 19 are also present in VARIN 14. Uh, as for VARIN 8, um, I... Uh, I have even less of an idea because uh, that was never properly uh, reviewed. Uh, let's see, do we have any questions in the chat here? Uh, pizza is always healthy, yes. Uh, what is the best way to start with Varin? Uh, well, this is um, not really the right webinar for that question, but there's, um, if you go to varin.com, I'm sure you'll, you'll find the answers to that. And yeah, so please reach out to me uh, on, on the Discord chat or, or Twitter or, or however you like. Uh, I would be really interested in hearing uh, your experiences and also uh, if you find any accessibility issues, uh, you can, of course, uh, well, you can report them through those means that I just mentioned, but also you can, of course, file bug tickets uh, in our GitHub repo, uh, ideally in the web components repository. And uh, we will triage it as part of our regular processes and um, try to get it, it fixed as soon as possible.
let's see if we have any more questions here. We are using 1 in 14. What should be the good reason to upgrade to 1 in 23? Well, accessibility is definitely one very good reason. So if accessibility is important to you, then I would strongly, strongly recommend upgrading to 1 in 23 because uh, it, it really is quite difficult to, to uh, reach the uh, corresponding level of, of accessibility um, in, in 1 in 14 as you can now in 1 in 23. Uh, there's a question about SEO for Vardin, uh, and again, that's not really an accessibility topic, and I can't really help with that, not an SEO expert. All right, that seems to be all the questions we had. So again, please um, register for, I'll just post that link one more time here. Please register for part two of this webinar uh, where uh, we're going to be looking into how to build accessible UIs with Biden 23. Uh, and also, uh, I'm going to also try to give you some, uh, some advice on how to test your Vardin applications for accessibility. All right, that's it, folks. Um, We seem to be out of questions, so I'm going to end end this webinar here. Thank you very much for attending, and uh, I hope to see you all in part two. Have a good rest of your day, guys. <laughs>